Hey, it's Plumber Tom. Thank you for watching my videos. I wanted to let you know really quickly about some awesome resources that I have for you as you're trying to learn. I have free practice tests that you can take if you're preparing for a state test. I have preparation courses that you can take that will guide you through that process if you're getting ready for a test. I have other courses that can help you in learning the plumbing trade. So make sure to check out those resources. You can find a link in the comments below. When you participate in those courses, you're helping me to be able to create more content. So I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. Hello, welcome to this presentation of International Plumbing Code Chapter 11. My name is Thomas, and in this chapter, we're looking specifically at storm drainage, roof drains, something commonly installed by plumbers, especially in the commercial setting. And we're gonna look at the specifics of what that's all about, how the roof drains are to be installed, all the regulations surrounding roof drains. So we start here with International Plumbing Code, Chapter 11, Storm Drainage. Rain, rain, go away. Come again some other day. Do you remember that saying? Children often would say that because you can't play outside when it's raining as well. And so rain tends to be kind of a downer thing. Also, generally people, you know, take vitamin D and happiness from sunshine. And when it's raining we tend to have a little more of a gloomy emotion. But the fact is, rain is good for us. We need the water, especially in the desert climates that we live in Western United States. And when water comes, we've got to be able to handle it. And that's what this chapter is all about. In fact, I wouldn't go so far as to say rain, go away. I would say, come when you need to. We're ready for you. That's what this chapter will help us do. There are a lot of different ways that you can handle storm water and divert it to a place where it's controlled. Obviously, the idea behind this whole chapter is to keep the inside of a building dry. When that rain comes or when other weather hits, we want to make sure that water is not going to get into the building and cause damage. So we create systems to be able to convey the water from where it's coming from or landing on the roof to somewhere else where it's fine, right? For the most part, we're just sending that off into the yard, into the gutters. But like I say, there's a lot of creative ways. Here's an example. This is a Chinese roof drain water chain uh, becoming popular around here. I have some relatives that love these and have installed them. Something aesthetically pleasing about just watching that water trickle down from one chain link to the next. But that's one thing we can observe about water, as we view these storm drain water chains, water sticks to water and water sticks to things. And so we can use those principles to our advantage and convey that water to places again where it won't be causing damage. Let's get into the code. We begin then with 1101 general. 1101.1 .1 gives us the scope and says that the provisions of this chapter shall govern the materials, design, construction, installation of storm drainage. 1101.2 talks about disposal or getting rid of that rainwater, specifically stating that rainwater shall drain to an approved place of disposal. Uh, here are some examples, flat areas, streets, lawns, but definitely the water needs to flow away from the building. This may be an issue if the landscape around the building is sloped towards the building. So there may have to be more work done, additional piping run, whatever it takes to make sure the water is not coming in towards the building, but that once it's diverted off the roof, it's sent downstream somewhere where it can't flood or damage the building. 1101.3 talks about prohibited drainage or places that you shouldn't be putting the storm drain water. This specifically states that storm water shall not be drained into sewers intended for sewage only. Now we find this within chapter 11, that there are some systems in some locations. Now we find this throughout this chapter 11, mention of a combination of sewage and stormwater drainage system. Some locations do combine both the stormwater and the sewer 
in a single system. This section of the code is saying, if there's a separate sewer system, then you should never be putting stormwater down into that. And the reason for that is that the sewer system is not going to be able to handle the high volume of water that will be flowing when it rains. It will overflow the system. And when it overflows the system, it overflows the treatment plants. And when it overflows the treatment plants, the treatment plants are not able to clean the water fast enough before they turn it back into the streams, lakes, and rivers that are around them. And so we get contamination in the water. And for that reason, we have to be careful not to put storm water into the sewage system. 1101.4 talks about tests. And just like any other drainage system or water system for that matter, when we install pipes, we wanna make sure that they are tested so that they can hold pressure and not leak inside the building. The testing of drainage for storm drains is the same as any other testing for drainage, so they refer us back to Chapter 3 of the International Plumbing Code, specifically Section 312, which gives us all of the information about how to test drainage. Now, as you might remember, you have two options for testing drains. You can use water, you can use air. Either test has to hold for at least 15 minutes, and... If you're using water, you need a, at least a 10 foot head of water that creates the water pressure. Or if you're using air, it's five PSI. 1101.5 speaks to the change of size of the pipe. And just like any other drainage systems that we're dealing with, we are told not to reduce the pipe size in the direction of flow. This is going to cause a possible blockage. And so just like anything else, when a size gets bigger, it remains bigger, we never shrink as we go. 11.1.6 gives us information about fittings and connections and states that we're gonna use the same type of fittings, the same type of pipe as we do back in chapter seven. They refer us to table 706.3. 11.1.7 talks about the design of the roof. Now, obviously plumbers don't design roofs. That's someone else's job, but it is part of plumbing code that the roof be properly designed to handle the weight of water that could pond on the roof. Ponding means that the drain is blocked and the water is starting to collect on the roof. Please keep in mind that water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. So as those gallons add up on the roof, so does the weight. And the roof has to be designed for the maximum possible depth of water that will pond on that roof if the primary drain is blocked. Now the maximum measurement is taken from the top of the secondary drain, assuming that if the primary drain is plugged, the secondary drain is then going to be taking the water and letting it out somewhere else. So the weight of that ponding water for which the roof must be designed would be taken from the primary drain being blocked and the amount of water that would collect as a result until it overflows into the secondary drain. If the roof is not properly designed, it is possible that the roof can collapse. So <laughs> we're gonna leave that to the engineers and architects, but they better do their job, right? To avoid these sort of disasters. 1101.8 states that cleanouts will be installed with these drains similar to any others. It says it shall comply with the provisions for sanitary drainage cleanouts. So back in chapter seven, we learn about when and where we should have those cleanouts. The exact same rules apply for storm drainage. Similarly, in 1101.9, we learn that there may be some situations where backwater valves would be used in a storm drainage setting. If that's the case, they refer us back to section 715 in drainage for all the requirements needed on backwater valves. In 1102, we get specifics about the materials used for storm drains. 1102.1 says in general, it's going to be the same materials as the sanitary drainage system that we saw in chapter seven, as I mentioned previously. 1102.2 says that inside storm drainage conductors are going to be listed on table 702.1. 
Underground building storm drain pipe would be listed on table 702.2. This is table 702.1, and it has a variety of materials that can be used for drains, including ABS, cast iron, copper, PVC. What ones we'll see most common on storm drains are going to be cast iron and PVC. Cast iron drains are often used for several reasons. One, they are more quiet in a building than plastic or PVC. So when you're running roof drains, roof drains can be particularly noisy as water's flowing through and in the building, you're gonna hear that. Cast iron is often known as quiet pipe because it doesn't transfer the noise of the fluids inside of it as well. That's not to say you'll never hear it, but it is quieter than plastics. Another reason that cast iron is often used in commercial buildings is because it's more durable in a fire than plastics are. So with commercial buildings, they try to improve that quality of the building. If it catches on fire, will the systems stay intact and minimize damages? One other side note on cast iron is that, frankly, everyone involved makes more money for installing cast iron, right? If the engineer gets a cut for what materials are installed in the building, he's gonna make more because it costs more. If the plumber is going to be selling cast iron and he marks it up, he's going to make more because it costs more. So on the commercial end, we see that all around. <laughs> People like to make money in commercial. But that's not written in the code. That's just Plumber Tom opinion. Table 702.2 gives us the materials that can be used underground, both in sanitary drainage, but also in storm drains. And you'll find a similar list of materials. However, it is not uncommon for storm drains to be run below ground in PVC because plastics, frankly, will last longer below ground than cast iron will. Now, cast iron has, you know, some protective coatings, but over time, the earth and the water and the earth are going to eat through and plastics do just fine underground. Plus, you can't hear it underground, so who cares, right? So it's not uncommon for these to be run below ground as storm drainage. There is a table 1102.5 that gives us specific materials that can be used for subsoil drains. 1102.6 talks about the roof drains themselves. These are the bowl shaped drains that are installed on the roof. These assemblies have to meet certain standards from the ASME. And that's basically what that section is telling us. 1102.7 talks about the fittings. We've talked about pipe. Fittings have to be approved, just like in Chapter 7, and have no ledges, shoulders, reductions capable of obstructing the flow. If we're using cast iron, we want to make sure to look over those fittings and make sure there's not any huge tar globs or defects from manufacturing. Also, not a bad idea to look for pinhole leaks, little spots on the fitting, because it's always less fun to find those after it's full of water. 1102.7 also comes with a table. It lists out the types of materials that can be used for fittings. Let's move on to 1103. 1103 talks about traps. And when we're speaking of traps, we're speaking specifically of a building trap. Now, i am pause here and say that storm drainage, other than that, doesn't have traps. When you connect to a storm drain or a roof drain, you just run the pipe. There's no trapping it. Well, that's partly because the reason we have traps is to keep the sewer gases from blowing up into our face. But if you're on the roof and sewer gas from the storm drains are coming out, first of all, it's not going to stink like a sanitary sewer. Second of all, who cares? We're not going to spend that much time there, right? But back to the traps. Some jurisdictions won't even allow this because it's for systems that have combined sanitary and storm drainage sewers. It says leaders and storm drains connected to a combined sewer shall be trapped. Again, talking about that combination of storm drain and sewer drain. In this section, materials are listed. A little bit is mentioned of the size and the necessity for cleanouts. For a lot of areas, this really doesn't have any application because we don't put building traps in. At this point, we need to take a Definition timeout. Before we get any further into this chapter, you need to understand the difference between a conductor and a leader. And if you haven't been to chapter two in a while, you might not know. So let's do that. 
Chapter 2 in the International Plumbing Code gives us definitions and says that a conductor is a pipe inside the building. Emphasis on inside the building. Conductor is inside the building, and it conveys storm water from the roof to a storm building drain. This is what plumbers install, okay? We install conductors for the most part. There may be some instances where we're involved with some piping outside, but for the most part, when we're running roof trains, we're inside the building and we're installing conductors. So what is a leader? A leader is an exterior drainage pipe for conveying stormwater. Exterior being outside of the building, right? So exterior drainage pipe that's conveying stormwater from the roof or a gutter system to an approved means of disposal, just getting the water somewhere away from the building. That's the difference between a conductor and a leader. Conductor is inside, leader is outside. You need to understand that. As we go forward, we'll talk about the different sizing methods for each, and you need to know what you're talking about. And especially as a plumber, if you're ever involved with roof drains, it's good to know that you're dealing with conductors. Section 1104 talks about conductors and connections. Good thing you know what a conductor is. That's what we deal with as plumbers. 1104.1 talks about prohibited use and says that a conductor, that's a pipe inside the building, shall not be used as a soil waste or vent pipe. This is where inside the building, we have very clear separation of the sanitary system that's what collects waste from all the fixtures and our storm system, which is just conveying water from the roof to somewhere else. 1104.2 addresses the possibility of connecting an area floor drain to the storm drainage system, in which case it would be set up like a floor drain and need a trap, but the Utah Amendments has prohibited that so at least here in Utah, we are not allowed to connect any floor drains to the storm drainage system. All right, that gets us through section 1104. Join me in the next video where we'll go from 1105 to the end of the chapter. We'll talk about sizing and other important installation requirements for storm drainage. I'll see you then.